In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you've made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that, truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy in us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy in us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy in us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcomed the wayward, and you embraced us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace, and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, your Savior, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 32. 
Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no God. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and you did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. A reading from 2 Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow eats, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here, I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. 
He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. But his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've worked like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And his father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that was a long passage, perhaps the longest one we get this Lent. Though it might have been, and perhaps should have been longer. Well, Palm Sunday will be longer. You may have noticed that several verses of this chapter were cut out, skipped over. When I sat down yesterday to write this sermon, I, I looked up what they were. They recount two shorter object parables in response to the Pharisees and scribes, the lost and found sheep and the lost and found coin. It probably bears mentioning their presence here, if only to note how important it was to, for Jesus to confront the grumbling attitude attributed to the Pharisees and scribes. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, the punchline in Jesus' parables, all three of them in a sense, is the rejoicing in the restoration of the lost which Jesus likens to the heavenly joy and repentance to sinners in those first two, almost exactly the same. I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. But I guess those two stories were too abstract, or at least Jesus thought so. The sheep and the coin are lost, but not in the same way a sinner really is. That is to say, willfully lost. And to make a conclusion about repentance is a bit of a stretch. I mean, after all, neither the sheep nor the coin are repentant, as we usually think of it. There is no consciousness of guilt on their part. And certainly they are unable to rescue themselves. They must be sought, rescued, found by another. In these little stories, repentance is understood primarily by its end rather than its beginning. The point of repentance is the restoration of what was lost. Certainly this element alone is an important lesson about the human condition and the role of grace as God's initiative and God's action to restore what was lost to where it belongs. These shorter parables are just as well known, I think, and they are effective object lessons. They speak to how Jesus interacts with sinners so scornfully regarded by his critics. He welcomes them. So, why then this third story? 
What it really seems to illustrate is the conclusion he has already stated. It not only speaks of the restoration of the lost, but of the joy at the restoration. Added in his third parable, in its final section, concerning the elder brother. Here, Jesus clearly addresses the scorn and the grumbling. Here, Jesus speaks directly to his critics, not with scolding or condemnation, but with the Father's entreaty to join in the celebration. Here, he teaches them to regard no one from a human point of view. Now, let's back up a bit. Just to make some observations about that wayward son, the sheep gone astray, that lost coin on two legs. His predicament is not morally neutral as with the sheep and coin. It is a situation he finds himself in of his own creation. Not his choice to go out into the world with his inheritance and make his own way, that's not something blameworthy. It may have been done with the best of intentions, though clearly it was a mistake. He was foolish at best, but whether reckless or arrogant or decadent in his choices, he is ruined. His broken and friendless state is not unlike that of the sheep and the coin. His story is unlike theirs, though, in that there is no search. Neither the sheep nor the coin could have gotten so far on their own. But the son was in a distant country. Unlike them, he was possessed of an intellect and of an autonomy, a will that put distance between where he was and home. But that also means he had an advantage they do not. He had a memory of that place and of the way home. He came to himself, Jesus said. He had a consciousness of the grace he knew in his father's house. And just as the man went after his sheep and the woman swept for her coin, so the memory, the spirit, the heart of the father turned him back. That spirit is reflected in what follows. The father sees the son approaching as if he had been constantly watching during this whole time of absence. His love steadfast, his grace enduring. And while it's true that the son's memory of the father's just and gracious house set his feet toward home, chastened by the shambles of his life, the best he hoped for was to be a hired hand, not even a slave belonging to the household, but a hired hand. He will not seek to conceal his guilt. He will admit his error. He will gladly eat the crumbs that belong to the dogs. Oh, sorry, wrong parable. For the Pharisees and the scribes, and for many Christians throughout the centuries, even to this day, that would have been a proper and satisfying end of the story, and enough. Decency would, of course, accept the man's contrition and grant his request. But he would still have to bear the consequences of his disrespect and his disgrace. His inheritance was taken. It was gone. He could no longer be a son. That man was dead. But if Jesus let the story end there, it would be an inadequate and unsatisfying conclusion as a portrayal of repentance. It would be barren. It would be grim. The pain of the estrangement that was present throughout the crisis portion of the story would still prevail, both for the son and for the father. The story could not simply be one of return and an admission of guilt. The guilt admission would be honest, it would be just, but it would not heal, it would not bring joy. Yet joy is evident in Paul's preaching, 
So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So before the man even gets there, Jesus tells of the father running to his son, filled with compassion and an embrace and a kiss. This man makes his prepared declaration, but it falls on deaf ears. Not because the father doesn't want to hear it. But the father does not address this confession. He has no interest in affirming the man's guilt. He has no interest in a hireling. He wants his son back. So there is only one proper response. He declares his son alive and found. He calls for a robe and a ring and sandals and a feast. Here we learn. Repentance is unfinished until there is the restoration is complete. Then there can be joy on earth and in heaven. Then grace is manifest. Then the steadfast love of the Lord is made known. They talk about the aging of the church, but I'm not even sure that many of you here are old enough to remember the old service that be, had near the very opening the words from today's psalm, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now there's a description of repentance, of course, but with a clear understanding and the promise of restoration, of healing, and of new life. To be sure, amendment of life was the goal of this restoration, but not a precondition for it. My remark earlier about people in the church reflects a time when penitents in the church upon their confession and depending on the gravity of their sin were only gradually readmitted to full fellowship in the church, sometimes extending years. They might have to wait outside the church door during the whole service, just weeping for a while on their knees. And then they could come in the back door and stand there for a bit. And then maybe they could come up into the sanctuary after a year or two, and maybe after five or ten years, finally come back to communion. The Pharisees and the scribes and the elder brother, that scheme would have pleased them. Oh, yeah, we have to speak about that elder brother, too. Sometimes it seems a coda to the parable, but it's just as important. It gives a vivid and earthly contrast to Jesus' words about the joy in heaven occasioned by a sinner's repentance. Now this older son, to all appearances, is the epitome of the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What's striking is that even those Sons, say, who are presumably righteous, who keep faith in their duties and filial obligations, well, they do not always grasp that they live day to day as under the grace, under grace. As in the parable, the father reminds his older grumbling son, all that I have is yours. As the day began, that elder brother would have had little or nothing to reproach himself for, repent of, though we might wonder if he ever even gave his missing brother a second thought. But as the day draws to a close, we might say he, he is far from his father's house in a distant country. His spiritual inheritance, no less a shambles than his brother's finances. And his daily bread might just as well have been the pods the swine fed on. Saddest of all, and here's the lesson Jesus is giving to the grumblers, in failing to rec recognize the restoration 
of his resurrected, should dare we say, brother. It is he who is alienated and dead and lost. Like his brother through a situation of his own making, he is now the one who is lost. At this point, the action of the two parables, earlier parables, reappears. The whereabouts of the lost coin are known. And so just as this, the man who went after his sheep and the woman swept for her coin, the father goes out to the missing son, the older one now, as an ambassador of grace, so that he too may repent, come home, into the home, be restored, and be alive again. And Jesus breaks off the story there. Its final conclusion is unknown. Would the words of the father find their mark? Would the elder son come to himself? Would the Pharisees and the scribes? Would we? Now I think we must conclude that the father, at least, would return to the house and rejoin the celebration. But if the rest of the story means anything, if the elder son did not go back in with him, at all times, while he was inside, the father kept, his, kept one eye on the door. I think this may be the quintessential parable for Lent. Recall how on Ash Wednesday, we heard some of the same words from 2 Corinthians. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Merciful God, accompany our journey throughout these days of Lent. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, may the one who began a good work among you bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ, so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 